minutes. Um, has everybody been able to review the minutes? I know we just we got them out, um, but the videos are on YouTube as well. Do we need a formal approval? Yes. Okay. I uh, move that we approve the minutes for March or May 9th, April 11th, and March 14th for the Park Board. Second. Any questions or discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Awesome. All right, new items for consideration. Um, do we want to jump into the board elections first? I think so, so I think we've avoided it a couple. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to force you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. So how do we want to do this, Troy? We nominate park board member for the, is it president, vice president, and, and second, second, second president. vice president? Yep. Okay. Well, I would nominate uh, Chris Pompelli to serve as the president of the board. I second that. Do you guys have any questions or discussion? No? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Awesome. We got a new president. Yeah. So does he start the next meeting? <laughs> um, okay, we need a vice president and a second vice president. Um, any nominations for other board members? I would like to move uh, that Alejo Cabral uh, be nominated for first vice chair, vice president of the park board. I second that. Okay, any discussion? All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, and then we need a second vice. Um, I, would, I would move, we have Phil. Uh, serve as our second vice president of the board. Are you interested? Are you interested? <laughs> I didn't ask you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. I just feel like you'd be great. You'd be amazing. I would. I would second that motion. <laughs> based based on pending approval. <laughs> Any discussion? Are you sure? I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> Twist hard enough. Sorry, Phil. Yeah. It's a little curveball. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. All right, well, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, we got a slate. Very good, I appreciate you guys doing that. <clears throat> I appreciate uh, you guys taking on the new role and um, it's very important and mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of work to be done, so. Oh yeah. All right. Thank you, Troy. Yeah. Um, all right, we will move on to uh, park naming, volleyball courts at Fairmount. Sure. So I want to introduce Daryl Carrington. Um, he had come to us with a proposal for a naming of a volleyball court over at Fairmount Park. And I told him that he has to do a presentation. Awesome. Um, and he says that he's really great at presentations, that he doesn't have a problem uh, meeting <laughs> with the board. And so I'm going to introduce Daryl. And Daryl, if you could come on up and uh, state your case. And if you need help with handing anything out, let me know. I also have While Daryl's getting ready, one of the things I wanted to share with you guys is that um, there is a policy that's put in place for naming uh, parks and buildings and those type of things. And uh, recently, it changed. In the past, you had to actually be deceased. But now, um, that doesn't have to be the case. And the situation that what we 
the council looks for is that whoever is nominated has significant impact in the community, um, that they've been a, uh, a pillar of activity for the, the uh, city. Um, a good example is Brewer Recreation Center. So the Recreation Center is named after one of our former um, African American mayors. And so it was really kind of a very important position. And so there was the community decided to put the push and Council Member Johnson asked that we uh, move forward with that. So the process is um, if uh, it's recommended by the park board, I'll take this to council for council to make the, the final decision. But council is always looking for that recommendation and in regards to any of the park facilities, parks and recreation facilities, uh, this uh, group is the one that makes that recommendation. So um, we've had uh, some really, really interesting conversations about what is prominent and permanent um, names for different facilities. So um, I'll let you think about that as, as I think Daryl might be ready. So. All right, Daryl, the floor is yours. Thank you. And um, I, first I want to ask, uh, how much time do I have? because I can talk way too much. <laughs> and if you do a timeout like that, that let me know when to wind down. I, I would say five to 10 minutes. Okay. Yep. And so thank you all. Uh, uh, what, so I'm, uh, my family um, and I are here as representatives of the Fairmount Neighborhood Association. Either, I mean, the fact that, that I live in Fairmount is, is, is quality. Uh, but I just want to say that I'm here representing not only me and my family, but the Neighborhood Association. And uh, the handouts that I gave you, uh, just to show you that uh, Fairmount Neighborhood Association, uh, if you don't know about Fairmount, we're quite the unique neighborhood. And I uh, wanted to sh illustrate by those handouts that even during uh, COVID, uh, uh, concerns. Uh, we made it a point. We 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 made it a point to meet throughout the last two years, and I just wanted to show you the last two of our neighborhood association newsletters. Uh, uh, and and also uh, the the the, uh, the one that's uh, the four color one. I really wanted to boast uh, on that. There's a it, it boasts some of the amenities in the community, and one of them is an island. We call it the Fairmount Island. It was, it was really a traffic diverter. Um, but the park and recs and, uh, uh, and your city attorney allowed the neighborhood association to adopt it. And so a public-private partnership ensued. And so instead of the Wichita Parks having to cut it, uh, now we maintain it. And we, um, we love it. And I just wanted to tell you that that public-private partnership is awesome. Uh, and we look forward to getting in, in, into more of those partnerships with you. Um, so I, I wanted to say that. And uh, I'm going to start with a little shock for you. So about six years ago, if you don't know, uh, Fairmount uh, Park uh, witnessed a crime. And that crime was shared with uh, the rest of the community in a um, very sensational fashion. As a result of that crime, though, it, it's true, we lost a life. We lost a member of our community, not the Fairmount community, but a, a, witch, a woman from Wichita. And, but as a result of that crime, um, there has been laser beam focused in the community. Partly because, again, of the sensationalism applied to that crime, um, uh, Wichita State University and uh, Kansas Health Foundation partnered uh, to, uh, I, 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 I would say, uh, to implement uh, triage to stop the bleeding. And so in my former life, I was um, elected to lead the, the uh, Enough is Enough campaign. And I served as, uh, I, I was fortunate to, to have all the confidence of President Bardot at Wichita State University. 
And um, so these images that I'm going to share with you are part of that, um, uh, of that responsibility uh, that, was, that I uh, wanted and, and applied for. Um, so I wanted to highlight for you the successes uh, as a result of that uh, charge that was placed on me. So this first page I just wanted to show you. The first page is uh, we, with the help of um, Ted Ayers, who's one of my mentors, uh, we uh, had a hospital in the park for a day uh, where people could come and, uh, I mean, we had everything from, from dentists to, prescript to a pharmacy in the park, and it was just the most awesome thing. And, I, and if you, if you it, I mean, it, it hasn't been duplicated since, um, but as you can see, we had over 500 volunteers in the park, and we served just under 300 people that day. Um, and so this, this relationship that we're building with the university and partners, we call them stakeholders, Ascension Group would be a stakeholder, um, uh, Wichita Park and Rex would be a stakeholder, um, Evergy would be a stakeholder. I mean, these are, these are stakeholders that came to the table, and they really made a difference in our community. And I, and I, won't, I will tell you, as a resident of, the, of Fairmount, it is so wonderful to be a part of a um, college community. It is just the most wonderful thing. And so um, so that, that's that. The reason why I'm here to, for you today is uh, I want to continue this effort to uh, increase life quality in Fairmount. I mean, that is our ultimate goal, to constantly increase life quality. And so, and so this was a part of it. And, and that's what all of these uh, uh, opportunities, there's Ted Ayers right there addressing the crowd. That's, that is what um, we do in Fairmount. I mean, that, that's our guiding light. Whatever increases life quality for all of the residents uh, is something that we, and Fairmount Neighborhood Association uh, and Wichita State University, that's, that's, that's what we, that passes the smell test. If it increases life quality, then you know, we're, we're, we're all about it. Reason why I'm here for you today, if you don't know the name of Jim Erickson, uh, please, please Google it. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Jim Erickson while I'm standing here. Um, and Jim Erickson um, is a retired associate professor at Wichita State. Jim Erickson has been teaching at Wichita State for over 30 years, and, and, and he never got tenured um, because of the character of Jim Erickson. He is a um, professor of English literature, and he has a title of emeritus. He's an awesome professor, but he came to Wichita from Minneapolis um, because he was promised a, uh, to be a part of a, uh, uh, a school of uh, film, a film school, um, but that never happened at Wichita. And the fact, he never forgave Wichita State for that, and he never, he never did any research. So that's why he remained an associate professor for his entire career. But he was an awesome, awesome man. And um, if, you, if you don't know, uh, Jim Erickson is uh, also a comedian. Uh, he's also a film critic. In fact, uh, he has, uh, um, uh, they applied a, a name. It's a term of endearment. They called him Old Flick. Um, he was pre Siskel and Ebert. Uh, that's pre my time. Um, and if, if, I'm, if I say anything wrong, please correct me. But before I got here, before I came to Wichita, I'm told that he would announce movies on one of the local stations. And he did it in a, in a very professional but uh, comedic kind of fashion. So, super guy. So aside from his dedication to the university, he lived in Fairmount on the corner of Roosevelt and 15th Street. Uh, his dedication to KMUW, and I think it was Cake, when he did the movies. Um, aside from that, one of the things that, uh, and again, this is before my time, that Jim Erickson, he's an avid volleyball player. And he had a volleyball uh, group that showed up at the park. Um, weekly, I believe it was. And, uh, and it was just, as it's described to me, uh, it was uh, a wonderful gathering that would gather every week. So in Jim's absence, uh, Jim Erickson died of COVID complications 
about a year and a half ago. And in Jim's absence, what, what I'm proposing, what I'm asking you to consider uh, is that we allow um, his memory to continue by naming a volleyball, uh, I call it a volleyball pit, um, but a volleyball court. Uh, we wanted to name it after Jim Erickson. Now, I did that informally, and then Mr. McGuire uh, reminded me that there's a formal process to this. <laughs> so, this is, this is, this is you know, again, I'm, we're being led by wonderful people, wonderful professionals, so I'm here to ask you formally if we can actually name the volleyball pit uh, uh, Jim Erickson Memorial Volleyball Pit. Now, one of the things I wanted to show you, and I have to go get it, In our, in our effort to increase life quality and demonstrate our, our, our healthy relationship with Wichita State University, um, Ted Ayers uh, is a very smart man. He's, he was a general counsel emeritus at Wichita State. He's recently retired. Ted Ayers uh, created what is called a Shocker Neighborhood Coalition. And it is a living document. I mean, he, he, he conceived it. Uh, and it's, it's our job. Uh, to, to grow this baby. And so in his, in his brilliance, what Ted did is he, uh, he approached uh, heads of departments. Uh, that would be heads of department at Wichita, Wichita State, um, City of Wichita, uh, Bob Layton, Troy Houtman, our, our police chief uh, on campus, as well as police chief in the City of Wichita. Heads of departments he solicited and asked them if they could be, if they would contribute their, um, uh, their, their brilliance to this effort. And, and Ted knew, and this is something, again, he's a brilliant man, he knew that things change so rapidly, especially in higher learning institutions like Wichita State or other, other universities. He knew that people come and people go, um, but, but this would be a, um, a living uh, a document. So as you all know, Dr. Bardot and, and, and Deborah Bardot has, have, have passed on, but Rick Muma has, 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 has grabbed the baton, and he, he's also a, a, an advocate of our effort. So we created, um, it's, it's a yard sign. It's, it says Shopper Neighborhood Coalition Fairmount. Um, this yard sign can be used in various uh, neighborhoods around the university. It could say Kenmar. It could say uh, North. I think they call it North. Oh, it, it can, it can, you know, we started with Fairmount, we created this so that other neighborhoods wouldn't have to reinvent the wheel. So Shocker Neighborhood Coalition uh, is an advocacy group. And so when I raised this thing with uh, Dr. Erickson, the idea, I went to the university, and the university was, I mean, just so helpful. And um, so they donated, for example, um, they donated equipment, they donate their help. So, Shocker Neighborhood Coalition, and on, on the other side, and YGAN helped sponsor the development of this sign. So, in addition, we use, this is our logo. Uh, and our logo is actually, uh, we're, you know, the Fairmount Park is a center of our community. So, what this is describing is uh, Fairmount Park, actually. The beauty of the trees, uh, the beautiful pathways in the park, as you guys probably already know and our water park. Our frog is a feature of our water park and so is a dragon. So this is our, this is our logo, but this basically says, you know, we are here to stay. And each member who has this in their yard, they're, they're, they're members of the Neighborhood Association, which is a $5 a year dues. And, um, and we wanted to just to demonstrate. In fact, Levanta Williams asked us to sh if we can show our intentionality so we made yard signs, and we put them in yards, and people steal them. They, they're coveted, uh, because when it, when it snows, uh, we will, if you have this in your yard, we will clear your driveway for you or your walkway for you. I mean, there's the benefits to having this in your yard. Hence, they get stolen, and they're, they're coveted. So I wanted to share that with you. And um, I'll just go through these pictures really quick, just because they're just so wonderful. And, and, and it celebrates you guys also. Um, Fairmount is one of the most diverse communities in Cedric County, uh, mostly because we're right next door to the university. 
So we have people from all over the world that live in the community. And we're perpetually young. We never, our, our average age in our community never goes up because every year we get a new supply of young people. We get 17 and 18 year olds every year. So we are perpetually young in Fairmount. Um, that's, a, that's my wife, <laughs> who is a Fairmount resident. I, 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 I would say that she's a friendly Fairmount face. Um, this is a Fairmount church. You guys know, I hope, that this church founded the university. This church is over 100, it's on the Kansas Historic Registry. It's occupied, and this is the church that I, I, uh, I reside in. It's right down the street. It's on 15, 1650 Fairmount, and the university address is 1845. So it's like a block away from Fairmount. Of course, you know we have fraternity houses in Fairmount. These are other historic properties in Fairmount. Um, meeting spaces, this is World Impact. I don't, you guys know where World Impact is? It's right next to Grace Med. Uh, so we have all kinds of, I, I was really highlighting the infrastructure, because uh, Fairmount is so blessed with wonderful infrastructure. That's World Impact, Grace Med right there, right in the neighborhood. Of course, this is our wonderful park. This is where we meet. This, we call it the shelter house, um, but it's a community center. And I, I guess what I'm trying to do is show you that we are so fortunate in terms of our infrastructure. Um, and, there, and we share the same DNA as Wichita State University. As the community evolved, so did the university. In fact, the university was once called Fairmount Institute, um, but it, it evolved to Wichita State University. Um, just awesome stuff. And just the inside of that building, uh, we, we use it. Uh, we take advantage of the infrastructure. Uh, that actually was a meeting of, of uh, medical practitioners. This, this we had a, an, an event that was an art exhibit. We asked members of the community to bring out their favorite pieces of art so we can share with each other. I uh, just want to go through these. these. We, have, we have our Halloween parties here. We're a, little, we're a little jealous of College Hill. They have like this great Halloween thing. Uh, all of our kids go to College Hill. We never get trick-or-treaters. We never get trick-or-treaters at our door. They all go to College Hill because they have big parties. But we have a party in the shelter house before they go to college here. So to kind of take away a little bit of that, and of course that's Mr. Mr. Strong. Daryl, I hate to. Okay, I lastly, hate to lastly, I'm just gonna show okay. one or two more images. Concerts in the park. Uh, one last image and I'm gonna stop. This, these kinds of things, change the park. I mean, we have a train. Uh, we got that from the university. Um, I mean, it just changes the whole dynamic. Whenever there's a train in the park and kids, I mean, it's, adults become kids. It's just the coolest thing ever. So we're hoping that you will allow us to refer to the new, the new volleyball pit that we're redoing. It's a volleyball pit that um, had, had gone dormant for, for years. I've never seen it played on. I've been in Wichita, I've been in my, my house for 15 years. I've never seen anybody play volleyball in the park. So we're now reversing that. We're gonna activate the park. We have so much new housing in the neighborhood. And so all of these young people that are now gonna have the park to go to, it's just, you know, to have a volleyball pit and to name it Jim Erickson Memorial Volleyball Pit will just send, will speak volumes to the, to the students, meaning, hey, you know, this is a part of the, our, your university experience. We want that to be a part of the university experience. Okay, so that's that. Now, here's an ask that is not listed. So, um, and I do, I would encourage you, instead of me going over everything that Jim Erickson has done, um, he is so awesome, please Google uh, Jim Erickson and you'll, you'll see that the guy is just phenomenal. He is, he's phenomenal, he's a genius. Um, in addition to that, since I'm here before you, I don't know if I'll ever come before you again, but um, that island that we showed you, that Fairmount Island, um, right across here from the island, uh, because of old age, uh, we lost uh, Mary Osborne. And right down the street uh, on Gentry as well, we lost, and this is all due to COVID, we lost Jim Erickson, 
we lost Faye Leach. Faye Leach, uh, the Fairmount Park used to be called Leach's Dairy. Uh, the Leach's uh, had Guernsey cows in the park in 1920s, 1925. The, the Leach's uh, uh, successfully um, had, they rented that, they leased that property. The Leach's were successful in having the owners of that property give it to the city of Wichita, so, and it became Wichita uh, Fairmount Park. Faye Leach, uh, Jenny uh, Thompson, who uh, everybody misses, we're wanting to acknowledge our losses for the women, for the women uh, via the island. So we'd like to, to call that the Memorial Island. Uh, and then we'll, you know, we'll, we'll design something that, said that, that, that puts names like Faye Leach, Mary Osborne, Jenny Thompson, we would like to do that uh, in the island if we could. Yes, sir. Definitely appreciate that, and I can, I can hear the commitment you have to your neighborhood and to this park, and I just wanted to say from a personal level, I really appreciate all that you're putting into this. Uh, I, I think that more than likely, the folks on the board, I don't know if I'm speaking out of turn, probably, are sound, it sounds like you've, you've done a lot of work on this. The, the thing that I just wanted to make sure that we asked, just in the, in the sense of expediency, so have you had any kind of resistance, resistance to this among the neighbors? Have you had any kind of resistance among the district advisory board or the, or the uh, council member that represents district one? That's question number one. Question number two is, can we, can we hold, I, I think that sounds like an interesting idea about that island, but can we just keep it on the business uh, that's on the agenda for today? Sure. Sure. Would, be, would be my ask. So, so if you could just answer that question about the resistance that you've heard. Sure, and I apologize. I'm taking okay. advantage of you while I'm here. No, I appreciate um, that. Yes, no. Okay. No resistance. Zero. Okay. Zero. Uh, the only concern that I, that I had when I presented this to the Neighborhood Association was um, I wanted to honor Faye Leach at the same time with Jim Erickson. Uh, they're both wonderful people. And uh, the ladies in the meeting said that they didn't necessarily want to attach Faye Leach to a volleyball right. game. So hence the idea of all the ladies being near the floral and the fauna of, uh, of our community, which is beautiful. Yeah, I, I definitely, uh, can, I, again, I, as somebody who reps his neighborhood, I know exactly what you're talking about. I seriously, I think it's amazing what you're doing. So on that second piece, let's continue that conversation just on, a, on another day, just so we can move forward through this agenda would be my recommendation. I don't want to, unless the other members of the board have any questions, I would make a motion, or actually I, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to Alejo because he's- No, you're good. I, I do have a question. Have you, uh, Mr. Ms. Mr. Carrington, have you had the opportunity to speak with Mr. Erickson's family? So, thank you for asking. So Mr. Erickson doesn't have family. Okay. In fact, um, when he passed away, I had to, when he passed away, um, he gave everything to Wichita State University. Everything. Okay. Hmm. Everything. And he had an awesome library. I mean, you can only imagine. The, the God, just everything. Sure. Um, and I'll, I'll just say this, because I, I think it's worth saying. When it, when it was announced of his death, it was announced on KMUW. K, mm -hmm. KMUW um, people started breaking in his house uh, because they knew of his genius. And, and his, his home became a target. And so I um, contacted my community police officer. I had the key to his house. I boarded up his house like it was a hurricane coming through. Um, and uh, I couldn't go see him in the hospital either because I wasn't family and it was a COVID situation. Sure. So he died alone. Okay. Yeah. Thank um, you for asking. Certainly. And then you, I heard, I, did I hear you make a comment that you were, the, your, the volleyball courts are getting redone? Is so that thank, correct? Yeah, so thank you. So um, Wichita State donated uh, the volleyball apparatus um, and, and benches. We have like a memorial bench you know, near the volleyball pit, we have to have a place for people to sit down. So they, do, they donated two benches. This is uh, Ms. Patterson, who I think she's the uh, engineering person at Wichita State. She works at the physical plant. They donated that. And then uh, Mr. McGuire uh, has already started uh, redoing the, uh, he, he, he treated the sand. Mm -hmm. uh, they've already done that, just yeah, if you don't know that. Spraying off the turf, getting rid of all the grass and weeds and the sand, and we're going to bring out the mud sand. And Daryl has Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so, thanks for asking that question. Troy, so is there anything that stops us from 
recommending it to list as memorial or is it just needs to be gymerics and volleyball courts? So, as I mentioned earlier, typically this is a really high profile mm -hmm. opportunity, uh, like mayors, um, that you know, this kind of goes through, and usually high profile facilities like a, a building and whatnot. <clears throat> if this moves forward, I have to justify this to council, and uh, I, I would need a whole lot more information as to why and what huge impacts he's had in, into the community. Um, uh, so, you know, it, it, it might be your judgment. Um, that's, that's what it comes down to. Uh, we had thought about this and talked about it and said there's other options as well. Uh, we've done situations where we've uh, brought in a bench with a plaque uh, near that location and that kind of stuff. Uh, we've done that multitude of times and, and also dedicating trees uh, and, and, and in those type of situations with a plaque. Um, so, there are other options as well. Just wanted you guys to have all those options. Um, Daryl, would you, um, to, to answer some of the questions that uh, Troy brought up, or um, would you, do you have like uh, statements of support from the community about the impact that he made on them, or the impact that he made to the Fairmount? neighborhood oh yes um not only stay i mean i have so much in front of me right now sure, and, sure, sure. and i could like um i mean i, I know i've already been here for 30 minutes You're but good. uh I, um, I can share them with you or mm -hmm. i can share them with city council i can share them with troy so he can share them with city council yeah. i mean yeah so i i shouldn't ask you this question but i just have to are you familiar with that name at all uh jim erickson oh, okay I hadn't heard of I that. remember the story when it came out. I do remember that. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you I mean when that. he passed on? Yeah. I, I, and, and I actually looked at it while you were talking. I, oh. I looked him up and I remember that story. So yeah. it's, I mean, I think that that's a discussion that's worth having about like the, I mean, clearly a public figure in the community, in that, especially that neighborhood. Sure. Um, so that alone, that story has laid my fears on that. I think it probably would be a good diligence work to provide Troy, you know, pending if we do move on this and if it is accepted by the body, I would say next step would be follow up action outside of the meeting, provide Troy with a docket full of, or just a folder full of qualifying sure. information, I think would be most expedient. How would that? Yeah, yeah, I think if we could move forward with that, then we can. Maybe at the next meeting, sure. have a continue with the conversation and see about um, that'll give it. I think that'll get everybody on the board an opportunity to review, and we can get it to council member as well, council member Johnson, and he can review it ahead of time as well. So there isn't any surprises or anything like that from his end, and Super. just start stacking up. I appreciate that. Yes, thank you, and, and thanks for your time. Really. Certainly, no, Again, thank I you. I can Darryl. talk forever, uh, and <laughs> and I. Never used to talk this much. No, you're great. No, I, I'll, I'll echo uh, what Chris mentioned, but thank you for your support of the park. Yeah. And I mean, your investment in our facilities. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, as I leave, I'll just say this as I leave. This is a true story. Um, about six years ago, uh, you had just hired a director, park and rec director, someone who uh, hails from. Uh, New Mexico. And Wichita State was playing New Mexico the week that you hired um, Mr. Houtman. Uh, and I invited Mr. Houtman to the game. He had just come into Wichita. And uh, he accepted it, but then he had to call me later because uh, him and his wife had other plans and he couldn't make it. Um, that was the night. That was the same night that at the end of that game is when that event occurred uh, in the Fairmount Park. Huh. And so uh, in my life, it's like before the, that effort, that, that crime, and then after. And it is, it's really shaped our world. And, um, and so ever since that, ever since Troy's arrival, and, and uh, I mean, we have uh, been nothing but uh, fortunate. Uh, sure. Uh, for the for the stakeholders. So just thank you for what you guys have done and I look forward to engaging you. Now 
do I just take this out or is there are there any other questions I can answer? Any other questions? Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you. So we'll put it back on the agenda for next month. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, uh, Alejo, I really appreciate the comment you made that uh, we probably should brief Councilmember Johnson and um, Daryl if he can really bring some substantial qualifications um, in, in some kind of brief document, that would be fantastic. So thank you. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you. All right, next up we've got Becky Middleton, Lights at Edgemore Pickleball Courts. Yes. So a little bit of background. Becky's visited us in the past about pickleball and um, <clears throat> Things are always changing and moving quickly and moving forward. And th this goes back to the Edgemore location. And we've been looking at other options, or several options. It's always good to have options. And so Becky's going to share some of those thoughts and a little bit more um, updates in regards to the situation around pickleball and the situation around this location. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Becky, floor yeah. yours. Do I have to speak into this? Can you hear me? Please. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, very and, well. And, and by uh, the way, it's not just for us here, but it's also, this is recorded and also will be, re be viewed on YouTube. Okay. So, okay. Oh, boy. <laughs> Don't read the comments. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm not sure that I ever really uh, engaged with too many of you, uh, maybe a, a few of you in a smaller meeting, but because of COVID, We've had some uh, difficulties hooking up, but I'm glad we did today, and I appreciate you inviting me. And um, I'm a Wichita native and a former tennis player, and I am an honorary board member of the Mo Connolly Tennis Foundation after serving 15 years, and I've been a businesswoman and community leader for over 40 years. Um, I, I wear two hats. I, I advocate for pickleball because I feel like that's where the future is right now. Um, and I also have a deep respect and love for tennis because that's what, it, it changed the course of my life and, and that's how I ended up playing pickleball. So I, I think the two go hand in hand and uh, I'd like to see us work together, the two sports, um, a little better than we have in the past. and. So um, on one of your board meetings in April of 2021, there was uh, a lot of opposition. You just talk about was there um, any opposition to what I'm talking about today? Yes, there was. Um, we had, there's a, the map that I just gave you represents the Edgemore Park that I'm going to talk about. And um, basically, we wanted to get two more tennis courts converted to six more pickleball courts because we need lights for pickleball. And when the tennis community got wind that we were doing that, they wrote 27 letters to your board, of which were read to you on April 4th, I believe it was, of 2021. And it took a, a great deal of your time. And uh, so I. I think um, we had a small meeting after that and was denied the lights. So that's why I'm back here today because it's been over a year, a lot has happened. Um, I've watched pickleball grow again by leaps and bounds and it's a dynamic sport and um, changes rapidly, constantly. And so I, I really feel it's worthy of revisiting this issue again. So um, thank you for letting me be here to do that today. Um, a, a little short history of myself. Uh, I got interested in pickleball in about 2014, and I was really excited about the sport. And uh, the first time I played it was in Andover, and I thought, this is so great. This is wonderful, and what can I do to give this sport and bring this sport to Wichita in a bigger way that um, then, then what they were doing at Andover. Nothing wrong with what they were doing at Andover, but 
so I got excited about it, and uh, I received a grant for $25,000 that covered the cost of converting two tennis courts at Edgemore into six outdoor pickleball courts, which you can see there on the, the map. Um, those are the original first public outdoor pickleball courts in the city of Wichita. And the Latner Foundation uh, was visionaries. They were visionaries. They could, they could see what pickleball would, could be, and they trusted me to help it explode, and it did. So then, um, in 2018, I recognized that the three seldom used junior tennis courts at Riverside would also be a perfect candidate for conversion. And again, the Latner Foundation stepped up and gave us $25,000 more to do those three pickleball courts into, or those three tennis courts into pickleball courts. So um, that gave us nine total. Um, at a later date, Seneca Park was converted at the expense and, um, of the city, and it was an abandoned, beyond repair tennis complex. And it was basically, it's gone from a homeless park to a family park after the city converted it. And the six courts are full every weekend and most every weekday with people waiting in line to play. After working with the city to design and develop Seneca Park, um, it has new life and it's been transformed. And that's what pickleball will do to a neighborhood. In April of 2021, I asked to convert the two tennis courts under the lights for pickleball. And like I said, I, you, you guys received 27 opposing letters. Uh, I've taken the time since then, which is over a year, and um, I've had a lot of time to think about it. And I've listened to all of the letters at least three times and made a lot of notes and address, I want to address some of the issues that they brought up. And because I've never really had a chance to come back with any of my own remarks. Um, let's see, uh, in spring of 2021, six more courts were built at Riverside, giving a total of nine pickleball courts at Riverside. And um, th that's many years in the making. They also made, um, more tennis courts, they have a tournament site now at Riverside for tennis, and that's, that's wonderful because it, it was a long time in the making. On the Mo Conley board, we worked on that and saved our money for almost 40 years to give $405,000 to the city to improve tennis there, and also in the process build six more pickleball courts. So pickleball's uh, basically growing like crazy. Um, so much so, it's, uh, it's overwhelmingly positive. <laughs> but how do you um, handle that growth? How do you, how do you uh, handle the programming? And well, we've been able to hire a fellow by the name of Noy, and he's, he's now the director of pickleball for Wichita. So that is a step in the right direction. And with Noy in place, he's uh, started drills and uh, clinics, and he's also started leagues up. So with the leagues at Riverside now, which is, all of this is great news, um, but the, the downside of that is that the leagues are taking up the courts, and the leagues are played in the evenings, and it goes into dark, and so um, the people that had court time there, are, are I'm starting to hear complaints that we can't get a court at Riverside anymore because of the leagues. So it's obviously very critical to get more lights on other pickleball courts throughout the city. And Edgemore is the perfect candidate because we already have six. If we could get six more under the lights, we could also have our tournament site, which tennis has at Riverside. We, it would um, negate the possibility and, and the obligation to always have to tape off courts when we have tournaments. So it's, it's uh, twofold. We get uh, tournament site and we also get lights. So this is, pickleball is everything we knew it would be. And um, we just really need to pay attention to what, and be ready for the future because 
there's a lot of pressure on Riverside now, and it's just going to span out from there, and you're going to see the need for more pickleball courts constantly. So on Memorial Day, we had a pop-up party at Seneca Park, and it was a potluck, and we had six courts full of players all day long waiting in, with a waiting line from 8 in the morning until 5 that evening. Um, the following weekend, the ICT pickleball tournament was held at Riverside. There were 278 entries. That's a lot of people. So th that's, that's the reality of pickleball. There's, um, the people are out there, they, they love it, they want to play it. It changes the lives of people. So, like I said, I, I've had a year to listen to the letters or through, through the website and um, basically kind of break it down what the problems were and why it was denied. Um, tennis has 64 courts in Wichita. These are the two court complexes that are spread throughout the city, plus Riverside, plus McAdams, plus um, uh, Edgemore as well. So 64 tennis courts. Pickleball has 22. And when I go to Edgemore on the weekends, like this past weekend, there were 30 plus pickleball players and two tennis players. That were, and they left at 9.15, and, no, and I was there till 11.30, and nobody else showed up to play tennis. But the, the steady flow of pickleball players was, was there. It was constant. It's like that every weekend. Um, one of the reasons why it was denied was because there's a private school that um, doesn't have green space on their campus. So they're using Edgemore as an extended campus, and they um, say that it's, it's because of convenience, number one, and also they want visibility for their students to um, have scholarships, be seen by people who can give scholarships. Well, I drove from, I've been doing things, <laughs> I drove from uh, the classic school to Edgemore, and it's six to eight minutes and I drove it three times, different times of the day, and with, without much variance. So basically it's six to eight minutes. And then I drove from classic school to McAdams Park. And it's um, eight to 10 minutes. So that's not a whole lot more inconvenience for the classic school. And I was amazed at McAdams Park. I had never really been down there because it's not my neighborhood, it's not my rec center. I'm a rec center girl. I was raised at Osage, and um, it's a nice park. Those courts are in fabulous condition compared to Edgemore. Edgemore has five to ten more years of playability before the, the trip hazards get too great. They have a groundwater problem there, and uh, it's just a matter of time. So we really need to uh, think about the issues with the classic school using Edgemore just for convenience purposes, because McAdams is really two minutes less convenient. Um, and as far as visibility with their students and the um, scholarship visibility, Riverside is the place you need to be. Riverside is the premier regional center for, for recognition. This is where you get people to look at you for scholarships. This is the place where you go. And it's also a tournament site that Wichita just spent $1.5 million improving for this very purpose. And it should be utilized for that purpose, for the tennis people. So um, another letter that was written to you was from the WSU ladies tennis coach. And his objection came from, um, he, he just basically was against building, sacrificing more tennis courts for pickleball because they use them when they have their tennis tournaments. Uh, they, players will come over and, and just kind of practice there rather, you know, because they don't have enough courts to have their tournament and also practice. So um, 
Same thing, they can go to McAdams. And then we got a call, the pickleball people got a call from this tennis coach and WSU built pickleball courts, which is interesting that they didn't, that he didn't want Wichita public tennis courts to be used for pickleball courts, but WSU built them. And he wanted, this tennis coach wanted our pickleball community to come run a pickleball tournament on their new pickleball courts so that to raise money for the women's tennis tournament after writing a letter objecting to the Wichita building pickleball courts. So it's, it's kind of, um, on one hand, they, they want to oppose pickleball, and then on the other hand, they want to recognize how important they really think pickleball is. It can raise money for, for them. So um, we respectfully declined, and um, you know, hopefully, I think their tournament went fine, but it's just, I don't understand if you, do, if you want to have pickleball courts built at WSU, why wouldn't you want them built for the city of Wichita? Um, well, excuse me. Yes. Is there an issue here about lights at this court or the issue of pickleball supported by Wichita as a whole? Uh, I, no, like I'm happy with the way that the city has supported pickleball. But there needs to be lights at this court? At Edgemore, yes. And what is the cost of that? It's, it's uh, astronomical and out of reach. And we've priced lights, and Troy Houtman has been very instrumental in uh, late, most recently re-examining the, the type of lights that, we can, that are acceptable, the specifications that are acceptable to the city. We don't want to put junk up. We don't want to put things up that are uh, uh, people can vandalize, or you know, we want to put a quality product up that can last for a long time. So when you get into the industrial cost of lighting, it's it's out of reach. We have um, for the last four years, we've had a tournament, a pickleball tournament, and we've raised twenty five thousand dollars at twenty twenty dollars ahead for these tournaments and we have only $25,000 to spend on lighting or, or uh, converting pickleball courts or whatever we decide we can do. So, yes. Becky, yeah, well, yeah I, I'm just, if you could put in a, a, if you could paint the sky blue and you walk out today with the total victory, what does that look like? Because I'm actually, uh -huh. I just want to make certain that I understand what it is you're asking. For yeah, well, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm going to summarize that um, at the end of this, and I'm glad you asked because I'm almost at the end. Okay. So, yeah, my perfect dream would be to do what we asked for back in 2014, was to build pickleball courts under the lights. And... That's the least expensive uh, way to, do, to get lights for pickleball at Edgemore, is to move, is to get two more tennis courts converted to six pickleball courts. And those would be the north courts on that map. That those would be, those, those four tennis courts, we would take half of them for pickleball. And the, the, those four courts are lighted, the lights are there. Are there. The lights exist, yes. So we're just talking about uh, paint and minor repairs and uh, something that we can afford. And the, the second option would be to, and I hate to do this because this would not be one of my favorite options, but to flip-flop them. Uh, move the existing pickleball courts under the lights and then put tennis back where we take the pickleball courts out, which to, to me is like going in reverse. It's, it's, it's not progress. It's, it's the progress that we made in 2014, and I hate to destroy it. Not only that, the family that gave that money, you have to go to them and you have to say, we're going to destroy your project that you gave us money for. And I'll never be able to go back and ask the, that family foundation for money for anything. I just, you know, it's... It's, it's almost like saying, well, we want something brighter and shinier now, and what you gave us isn't working anymore, which it is. It still works. We just need something brighter and shinier, <laughs> like lights. So, so just to make sure I understand. Yes, ma'am. So Edgemore currently has, what, eight tennis courts that have lights. 
already and you're wanting to just convert two of the tennis courts into six pickleball courts that are under current lights. Is that what I'm understanding? Currently, um, tennis has six tennis courts remaining. Okay. okay, two on the south courts there and then four on the north there. Oh, okay. Okay, the four on the north are lighted. We oh, want to take two of those courts and have them be pickleball courts and have lights and then tennis would remain with four tennis courts. But that court is already lit, and so you just can, mm -hmm. your, your proposal is to convert those last two that are in that one pickleball section to pickleball courts instead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then we would have 50% of the concrete, and they would have 50% of the concrete. We would have 50% of the lights, they would have 50% of the lights. And Troy, has this been done before where we convert tennis courts into pickleball, and what is the cost of doing that? Yes, we actually did at this location, uh, where we converted the tennis courts into pickleball courts. Um, I can't recall what the cost was, but it is the cheapest. 25000 100000 uh, Oh. We talked to, when we, last year when we talked to the Park yeah. Foundation, it might have been like forty five or something. So obviously prices have changed in the past year, yeah. a lot of things, those parameters, but I'm guessing uh, between thirty and forty thousand dollars. The equivalent of let's say forty thousand, forty trees. No. <laughs> how, how many trees are we going to cut out to convert these to lights? To convert this. None. To yeah, the the idea of adding more lights. There's only a limited budget, so right. we lose something if we add something. Not necessarily. I mean, so what? What I'm trying to say is. The lights are already there, so we don't have to add lights. But we have to convert a court. Right, that's the cheapest and most economical yeah. transition. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, the, and Becky and her team and her the, the pickleball community remind me twenty five thousand is the amount that you've raised so far mm -hmm. to put towards the conversion of it. Yes, and we've also uh, had um, acknowledgement from the Wichita Parks Foundation mm -hmm. that they will contribute to our project as well. And so, so just so we're clear, do you have that initial funding for, like, because they would match you. So they have the funding in place? You've, yes. you've requested funding I'm, for this? I wanted to get, the park Foundation. I wanted okay. to run it by you guys first, be, sure. because there's no reason for me to go to them if I don't have your permission. But they are yeah. willing okay. to match our funds, and we do have $25,000 actually It's actually in raised. the Park Foundation bank account. Okay. I mean, yeah. that's, that's all fantastic. I'm just, I'm mm -hmm. imagining that if we just move forward on this without hearing from, I, I mean, like, I'm going to get a, get a racket to the head. Yeah, the uh, I mean, like, that, that's going to be a rowdy bunch of tennis pros yeah. that are, that if we just move, I mean, like, listen, I, I recognize that you can give anecdotal, you know, points on how there's a lesser utilization of tennis courts, but I'm just, I, if there's an economic opportunity here, I think that the park department should, should stand behind that, but not at the cost of alienating, you know, a, a, a staple sport in this community. That's just my one hesitation. I think, I think this is fantastic. So I, Chris, would, I would love, no, Nobody was asking that we make a motion today. Okay. It was more information. We just wanted to make sure that you understood some of the things that have changed. Yeah. The actual usage of what's being used. Um, obviously, there's a lot more demand for pickleball. Yeah. Um, this is a. Th this was a proposal that was made before because it was financially made the most sense, had had the least impact on conversion, and, and we wouldn't have to build another pickleball court uh, or build pickleball courts with lights or add lights. It's just the cheapest and most economical way to get this done. Now we do lose two tennis courts. Um, are there opportunities to use other tennis courts? That, that's something that we can always work with uh, the school on that. Um, there's, we had made some of those suggestions in the past. So we wanted to make sure that you guys understood all the parameters that, that are happening now, um, a year later uh, from when that proposal was last made. And just wanted to make sure you guys understood all the information. Thank you, if I could make one recommendation to you. you because I've, I've, we've connected and we've, we've, I've, I've heard the story, and I was here for the April meeting that we talked about. Um, if I remember correctly at that meeting, I think we had one or two people support, or one or two letters in support of the pickleball uh, conversion. 
And so I would encourage you to reach out to the pickleball community because part of what we heard was 27 people saying no and two people saying yes. Right. Yeah, uh, and, I, and I appreciate that comment. When I listened to the 27 letters, it, it took up almost two hours of your time because yes. each of those letters had to be read to you. And um, I don't remember any of those letters being pro pickleball. And so I, 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 did, I didn't go, I mean, I could probably have a thousand letters written from people in the pickleball community, but I didn't go there because you had so many letters from the tennis community that you had to listen to that had to go on record as being read to you. And then the next week, you, there was a big golf issue. And so you were... That's all right. <laughs> you want to, okay, well, if you want a bunch of letters, I'd be more than happy to I get them. I think that would just show the, you know, that you're wanting to convert to the tennis course. It would just show that there's enough people there that would support and use it and utilize that space mm -hmm. as two more. So I, I think that that's probably a pretty good idea. I, I understand where you're coming from. I didn't about, want to burden you. Know, not I, wanting to I didn't want to burden you. Yeah. You know, they oh, made that. their stance, and so yeah. if, if, yeah. You've, if you've got the community that would support the pickleball courts, then having, yep. you know. I'm happy to do that. Would you prefer that one letter be written and then just get no. lots of signatures, would, or do you want everybody to say? I think those say, unique stories are because if that's what we heard last on the last April was stories from parents and tennis players that sh they're sharing their stories and their perspectives that okay. I think that makes a bigger impact than one letter with 100 signatures okay how many letters do you want <laughs> however many you can get <laughs> okay I'll do that yeah. and uh, I'll get those to Troy yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and listen, the other thing, just looking forward, I think I completely agree with the fellow board members here. Just the, the, as much as you can, reach out to the members of the tennis community and, and make an effort to say, how is it we can accommodate for this change? Because life is, is better when people are, are working together to make certain their respective sports have, have as much access as you can. So I, I'm certain there's, you know, if you can have that dialogue, we can maybe have fewer uh, hostilities come next I, month? I did have that conversation. I did reach out to the tennis community. I met um, um, one of the people that wrote the letters, who's also an administrator of the school. I, I met them at Edgemoor, and we walked through everything, and we looked for common ground, and they're really not willing to give up any concrete. And um, they also informed me that if Pickleball wanted to try to get Eastview Park, that we would meet with more resistance than we did at Edgemore. So well, why don't we try to diffuse the situation? I did, I wish we know. could. Maybe instead of I did a, try. Yeah, I mean that's. I did reach out, you know. Um, yeah, I th well, I mean, like, how about I, I? I will say for my piece, we can discuss this separately, and I'm I, I'm sure staff. I don't want to say staff would be available for that, but I think having discussions separately and hoping that we can find that common ground rather than just letting it boil to. Uh, confrontation over mm -hmm. preferred forms of racket sport. Um, I, ju I, I just think we know there's opposition out there. I appreciate you, you bringing that forward. Some people might not have. I, I think that can help lead to a, a positive resolution because I think that's in everybody's best interest. Can we yeah. do a special meeting like we did with golf? just for pickleball and tennis to come to a compromise, an agreement to, of here's where, where we're at? Uh, sure. I mean that that, would, that way we can meet everyone's accommodation together in that way, you know. Yep. Um, and then we could diffuse the other matters in, in normal park we'll meeting that way. Troy, question with Eastview Park because I know we've talked about it before. Are those courts lit already? Yes. And there's only two courts. It's four. There's four courts. Four but, lit courts. But the big concern for the school was that they couldn't host practices and tournaments because they would lose. They wouldn't have their six courts together. Is that correct? They don't have six courts together. They have no, four and two. Yes, but they yeah. still have the six courts. At Edgemore. Yes. That's, yeah. That's what, yeah. yeah. So why don't we just convert Eastview? I mean, would pickleball be open to playing pickleball at Eastview, or do you all have to Well, the thing Edgemore? is, is if, if we're going to go to the expense and build more courts or, or convert more courts, we would prefer to do it at Edgemore because that would give us a tournament site. You have to have at least 12 courts to attract tournaments from out of state. 
Uh, otherwise, if we just have six pickleball courts, we have to tape off all the tennis courts, which is like 200 bucks every time you tape off courts enough to have a tournament. It's pickleball needs a tournament site. We don't have enough pickleball courts anywhere, even though we have nine courts at, at Riverside. It's no, still I'm, not I'm enough. I'm saying, can we convert all the Ed Eastview courts to pickleball? Like, no, they... only two tennis courts would convert to six pickleball courts. Yeah, I know. I wish we could get 12, but we can't. What's the cost of building pickleball courts, Jordan? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Flex <laughs> North. Okay, well, I will okay. get on my letter writing and uh, contact my people, and I appreciate your consideration, and uh, you'll hear back from me. Okay. Any further questions? Thank you, Becky. You're welcome. Okay. Riverside Community Guardian, Troy. Penny, I'm going to ask for your help. If you could pull up uh, um, Google Maps for me. So while Penny's pulling up Google Maps, uh, there's been a group in Riverside that's been wanting to develop a community garden on public land. And uh, we're looking at several other areas of doing community gardens. And these community gardens could be opportunities for addressing food deserts in different areas across the city. Um, and, and so we, we had, I'm getting interest uh, little by little here and there. It's a huge endeavor, it's a really big impact. Um, these folks over at Riverside, can you uh, pull up? The best way is to look at the entrance of Botanica. So as I mentioned, there's some folks from the community that uh, wanted to put a community garden on public property. They're actually losing their lease, and so one of the things we talked about was putting it in one of the areas in Riverside. But this particular lot, I'm going to point out here, it's right across the street from the golf course and across the street from, uh, from Botanica. And um, we've talked to several folks and we talked to that neighborhood as well as, um, well, I take that back. I'm not sure if we talked to the neighborhood, but we did talk to uh, the council member from this area and the gardening folks. And this is a proposed location of putting uh, a garden. That is city property. It is a piece of surplus city property. And I uh, would have to put a water connection to it to support the community garden. So. Um, after a long discussions with several stakeholders and folks, uh, this is kind of the location that's been agreed upon, and I think that's something that we're going to be moving forward with. So I wanted to share this with you guys. It's not parkland. Um, it's actually city land, and um, I did want to sell it and, and take the proceeds to support Botanica and the golf course, but uh, I don't, the, the neighborhood doesn't want it to be developed into, house, into houses. And so... I think we're going to look at this as a community garden. So I just wanted you guys to be aware of this um, and know about it in case you guys get any questions. So, any Perfect. questions? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, will there be a shelter on the site or a build outbuilding of any kind? There probably will be some kind of shed that will yep. house shovels and you know the, all the all the equipment. Okay. Uh, of course, my, my question would be surrounding water access for people who would utilize that facility separate from just gardening. I think that would be something that I hope moving forward that as they're building this, so it can be a community center that, that serves the human needs of, uh, of folks as they come in. Uh, the other issue is that would it strictly, as they as they have proposed right now, simply just be a garden? Would there be any other programming or any other, uh, like for example, when you talk about a food desert, I think a garden's great, but that's not necessarily serving the immediate needs of somebody who, let's say, needs to get fresh vegetables in a you know gathering of fresh vegetables, like it's bagged up and ready to go, like a CSA might be. Maybe that could be a space that people could purchase, and we partner with area places to area. 
uh, uh, food providers to do that. I just wanted to raise that as well as an option on these kind of facilities. So we haven't developed the MOU with the gardening group yet. Okay. But some of the expectations is that they'll donate certain percentages to some of the food banks. Okay. So the expectation is if you're going to use city land, um, that they would be able to, to use it, but part of the fee, not necessarily a fee in dollars, but an expectation would be a certain percentage of that, of their produce going to a, um, uh, what's the word I just used, a food bank. So, okay. so, so these just, are they, is this just like a group of urban farmers then? Or like what's the... From what I understand, the, uh, there's been an active community garden mm -hmm. in the in Riverside yes. before, and they've lost right. their lease because they want to sell the property. Okay. There were several proposals to go to other places, and a lot of people that opposed where they were proposed, where the new place was proposed. So, council member and some of the mm -hmm. master gardener who support that came up with this compromise, and the people who were opposed to like the Park Villa location agreed to this location. Mm -hmm. So there is an active community garden association or group there, and there'd be fencing around it, probably a small shed or something like that. And the Master Gardener program also has what they call plant a row. So any surplus pumpkins or squash or whatever can be donated to the food banks. Mm -hmm. So what do they so do? It's, it's not obligated, but sure. it's any surplus. So like, what do they do currently? Because the food desert piece was brought up. Like, what do they do to help like mitigate food deserts? Or I don't know. Just, like, it, it sounds like it's mostly people who don't have space in their own yard because it's so crowded in Riverside that they want to have a garden there, that they rent a space okay. and pay that to the association or whatever. Okay. Cool. Does it gonna? I mean, does it affect the parks department? Is it gonna affect you at all? I'm administering it, yes. <laughs> so um, I'll have to come up with the MOU to work with the gardening group. Uh, we'll have to do a water connection. Uh, part of the agreement is that we help pay for some of the water to a certain limit. Um, and again, the expectation is that they're going to have educational programs here. They're going to have opportunities for people to garden um, that might not have that ability and that there's going to be a requirement for a percentage of the food to go into a food bank. So would you have to be a part of that, that the gardening community to be able to get space there? Yeah, there is. Is that like a membership thing? I think it's a small membership, but yes. And, and there probably would be a waiting list um, to do that. But again, like I mentioned, this is just one of probably six that I've been talking to people about. And this could be a foundation and a catalyst for more and maybe a little bit different type of scenario. Um, over at Evergreen, we got a $5,000 grant from the United Way to put a, a, a community garden there. Uh, that wasn't quite enough to get us everything that we need, but we're trying to shoot for next spring to have a community garden there. And that was gonna have a, probably a little bit of a different setup where there's a group of volunteers that will work the land and more of that uh, produce from that land will be going to the food bank. There's already a system in place of donations through the churches. I uh, talked to somebody just today, uh, Councilmember Johnson and I were talking about in his district uh, putting in a uh, community garden there as well. Uh, Councilmember Hoheisel and I have talked about putting a community garden down in his district. And those are all food deserts and those are all opportunities to continue to grow food for those neighborhoods. This is a little bit of a different setup because it's already created. These folks already are doing this. Um, but the difference is that they'll be using public land instead of private land. And I think this is going to be a great foundation for some of the other locations as well. I think this is, this is super cool. I, I love the direction. And, and I want to say thank you for, you know, we, you and I have talked about the issue of food deserts and, and using park facilities like that. Well, the question I have is that since this is city property and not, not park board property, will they, would the proposal be to deed it to the park board more or less by the city? I just was curious of that process. So that, that's a really good question. That's something I talked to the real estate folks about to see if this actually becomes parkland. And more than likely it will be city parkland, not Board of Park Commissioners parkland. Um, so if you guys remember uh, your lessons that we took, there's actually two types of parklands. <laughs> so, um, so more than likely this would be city parkland uh, that we would turn this into. So. 
Thank Thanks. you, Joy. Okay, we're moving on to continuation of prior business. A quarterly CIP update from Tim. Thank you for, for having me this afternoon. Um, so this is the second time that I've been before you, so I guess just a little bit of um, a little bit of background. The 11 by 17 sheet that you have in front of you, that is something that we'll be going through. Um, so if you want to have that handy. Um, so I'm doing the uh, capital improvement program update. Um, wanting to make this a quarterly update just so you all have an idea of what's going on with the um, CIP projects. So a little bit of background. Um, the website, uh, the park and recreation website, was peri periodically updated uh, to show the different changes for the programs, kind of showing the steps uh, where they're at in the process, just to keep the public informed on where things are. Um, staff uses an internal spreadsheet uh, to track those projects. That's what you have in front of you. That's not what the city uh, website shows. Um, so um, Katie, who you'll be hearing from next, actually helps update this. So this is great to have uh, both of us here. Um, so you'll see, let's see if I can zoom out a little bit. OK. So as you'll see here on the front sheet of yours, um, there are four different, or excuse me, five different uh, categories. There are identified, initiated, scheduled, in progress, and completed. Um, so what, what's great for us is that we don't really have a whole lot in, in identified right now. Um, but once the new CIP gets approved, we will then update this to have all of the new CIP projects for next year. Uh, and that should be in sometime in August. Uh, so I'm guessing by the next time we're back, you'll see this list for identified become a lot, a lot longer, um, which is great. Um, great to have projects coming through here and seeing the, them progress through the stages, which is really pretty, pretty interesting if you ask me. Um, so there's different, uh, I guess, I guess categories or descriptions or information that we show on here. Um, so we show the project, the location, description, uh, cost. There's a photo or presentation, uh, and that's usually either a photo of kind of the project or if there's a design or rendering, um, for example, this one for South Lakes. Um, you'll see here, this is the presentation that was given on October 19th, 2021 uh, to City Council. Um, so there are a, a lot of interesting uh, pieces of information here and they're linked, uh, which, is, which is really great because then, oh, whoops, um, because then you can see uh, what all is going on. Oh, wow. One moment. Didn't realize I closed out of that. Alrighty. So I won't spend a whole lot of time going through these individually. I'll briefly go over them, won't read through the, the full description. Um, but at the end, if you have any questions, happy to uh, provide any information or, or, or background. Um, so the first one is the uh, Evergreen Rec Center and the Orchard Rec Center. Um, so that's part of the 2022 Rec Center Shelter Maintenance uh, Fund, um, which is used, as it says, for rec centers and shelter maintenance. Um, one thing that this fund is used for is for pretty much most of the things that happen within um, rec centers and with rec centers there are roofs on rec centers and if you've ever had to replace your roof you know that that is an expensive thing so we are uh, planning on hanging on to some of these funds uh, to help uh, pool that with next year's money to help replace the the roofs because you know when nothing's worse than a leaky roof and that's one of the most important things on a building. So that's one thing that, that's why this is hanging out here and identified, just to kind of save up money to make sure that we don't just 
patch it, we are able to actually replace them and, and do, um, do what's in the best interest for the long term of the buildings. Uh, one thing that you'll see here is also in, in uh, identified is the South Lakes Park Improvements construction. Uh, so that's for the South Lakes Sports Complex where we'll be building Pickleball Complex um, with, which I believe over, I think is 18 or possibly 20 uh, pickleball courts down at South Lake. So that's in design right now, and you'll see that uh, later on. So the, the total budget for that was $3 million. 300 of that was for the design fees. Uh, so going into initiated, um, we had the 2020 walking path systems. Uh, we are hanging on to some of that money uh, to hopefully uh, match a grant with the uh, land water conservation fund I think it's fund um, to help with the Chisholm Creek Park North um, if you've ever been out to Chisholm Creek Park North you know that a walking path that there would be a great amenity for the park um, for the 2022 playgrounds we are actually we're able to to uh, use a little bit of uh, earlier money from 2021 to help fund this, uh, just some leftover um, stuff to help improve these parks. Wasn't very much, but uh, helped us be able to work on Ailey and Meadows Park and also was able to help us with, uh, you'll see later on, two other parks to help install uh, engineer wood fiber. Uh, so trying to get away from some of those sand, um, sand playgrounds and go to the engineer wood fiber uh, helps, helps us a lot and, and makes for a nicer park. Um, aquatic master plan phase three, uh, pool house uh, renovations. There have been um, some challenges on getting uh, contractors to, to fully jump on some of these. Um, we are in the process of, of working on these to try to improve the pool house renovations. Um, so that's why it's an initiated and not scheduled because we don't have that work fully started or scheduled yet. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's the South Lake Park Improvements design. So that is uh, in the works. I don't believe it has been fully started. I think they're just hammering out a few contract details. So that will hang out here until we get into schedule when we start getting actual um, siting study complete uh, or have dates on those. Um, and th again, that was for $300,000 for the pickleball complex down at South Lakes. So moving into scheduled, so these are, and you'll see at the, at least on um, your handout, that there's a little note at the bottom that kind of indicates when things change from one section to another. So scheduled is when it, it is in design and it is, we have an idea of dates. We have, um, you know, we have, uh, someone's on board and it's in the works, um, but not fully in construction. So that's where there's, there's a little bit of difference between the scheduled and the in progress, which is the next section. So for NASCAR uh, Park, we are working with Garver on that. We are actually expecting a draft set uh, today, and the plan is to get that uh, construction started in October of this year. And again, that is to replace the artificial turf at NASCAR Park, uh, or excuse me, not replace the artificial turf, replace the, the natural grass with artificial turf to make that space more usable all year round. Uh, Stryker Complex Phase 8, so that's a clubhouse and indoor facility improvements. I uh, still need to follow up with um, our team there on exactly where they are in that. That is probably in progress or, or might be, um, but that is in the works. Uh, the Tennis Center Improvements Clubhouse Renovation, um, there are some, some money left over from the improvements that were made there. Uh, and the goal is to use that to help renovate the clubhouse. Um, we don't have, we have a, a general idea of cost and design uh, for that, but we're um, looking at other alternatives for funding to help with that, to help get that into the in progress and get uh, some updates to that, um, to that center or that clubhouse. Uh, scrolling down into in progress, um, so it, it's, just personally speaking, it's, it's fascinating watching some of these projects change through here. So when I'm updating these, um, it's very interesting to see how quickly some things move and somehow, you know, somehow it, it all gets done. Uh, and sometimes in a long time, sometimes very quickly. Uh, so the Splash Pratt renewal, uh, I think last time it was probably in uh, identified or maybe been initiated, it was probably initiated. 
And so right now, uh, it's in progress in getting some of those um, funds uh, completed, and some of that had to do with uh, just making sure that some of the splash pads were up and running. And now that, now that we're in full uh, pool and splash pad mode, uh, starting to use those funds to make sure that there are improvements happening with those. Uh, Swanson Pedestrian Bridge, that was uh, a huge item for, um, for our 2021 park facility enhancements. Um, so Swanson's Pedestrian Bridge uh, was way over budget, very way over budget, more than what we were expecting. Um, so we had, luckily we had a donation to uh, help with that and very thankful for the donation for that. Um, to, so we have that um, planned out. I think it was 19 weeks for the construction of the bridge with steel costs being so high. Uh, it, it does take a long time to, to get those bridges put together. So that this will be in progress for quite a while, uh, but the goal is to be done in fall. Um, of next year. Uh, the let, let, excuse me, Lynette Woodard Recreation Center improvements uh, working on uh, using some uh, grant funding there to help with security uh, at Lynette Woodard. Uh, Watson Event Center furnishing, this is very close to being wrapped up, just have a few more items to uh, clean up there uh, at Watson. The event center is absolutely beautiful. Um, if you haven't been over there to look at it, I would highly suggest next time you're in the area to just drive by, um, it, it's beautiful. Um, Emporia Park, so this is um, one that, that jumped up pretty quickly too. This one, uh, there was um, fire and vandalism done uh, on the playground, and uh, we are, I believe it started today, or it could have been on Friday, there were uh, vendors out there working on replacing uh, the uh, structure, one of the playground structures, and the board and bird forward in place surfacing and same for, for Fairmount, um, working on re repairing some of the family playground surfacing there. Um, so again, some of these move very quickly, some of them uh, take a little bit of time. Harrison Park was another one that uh, was, was really uh, moved pretty quickly. Uh, wanted, one interesting thing uh, is that uh, you know, we have quite a bit of things going on at, at Harrison. Uh, there's the splash pad and then we used uh, the uh, irrigation fund to help uh, irrigate that dog park. And we'll be talking about dog parks here later on. Um, Plainview Park, again, working on the splash pad there. Just Dry Lewis, one of those ones that's gonna take a little bit of time for that to get done, uh, but looking forward to that being completed later this year. Uh, Crystal Prairie Lake, uh, Park, this is one thing that we'll bring up later in the presentation uh, to talk about. Um, it is a very exciting uh, project and uh, can't wait to see uh, all improvements going on out there. Uh, and then McAdams, again, this is in progress. Uh, working through the design right now, there are a few challenges with the site, uh, but overall I think uh, it'll be a great thing for the, uh, for the community uh, in that neighborhood and the city in general. So now we get into some of the some of the fun stuff in terms of the things that are completed and are being used by the public. Um, some of these things are are new. Most of them have been on here for a little while. Katie was kind enough to clean up a lot of the uh, a lot of the older things that have been on there on on the website for a few years. So we're trying to keep the things that in the completed on there for a couple years now, just so it doesn't get, you know, 300 million different things because we you know we we do a lot. Uh, here and so I guess I'll start to highlight some of the new things to the list because I'm sure you uh, may know about some of the older things or can spend some time on the website to look at them but the new things to the list are Boston Park the basketball court there is completed the College Hill Park basketball court is completed Harvest Park basketball court completed and Plainview Park basketball court completed um, they are, they look great. The basketball goals that, that Troy uh, likes to use, they look great. They're very helpful. They're, they're not your standard park um, um, structures or basketball goals. They, they look nice and I can't wait to go play on one. Uh, again, the irrigation systems move very quickly from the initiated to completed. So irrigating the Harrison Dog Park because we found that 
dogs like to tear up yards and turf and everything. Um, somehow that, you know, somehow it just happens. Uh, so irrigating that to help uh, maintain our assets. Uh, so that's a great, great one for to do there. A Price Woodard, if you have, haven't been to it recently, it looks fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Uh, they did a great job and before uh, Riverfest, so I'm sure a lot of people got to, got to see the park and experience it. Um, so those are some of the, some of the new things to, uh, to this completed list and I encourage you all to go check out those uh, if you uh, have some time. Um, so getting back to the presentation. So a couple updates on notable past and future CIP projects. Um, so Clap Park, Clap Park Master Plan, um, that was adopted and completed last year. Um, there, it looks like we're gonna have funding for that next year uh, in 2023. Um, if you have been out there, uh, you know that some of the bridges are not in the best conditions. Um, now, some of them were retained in the master plan, and that's one thing that we're wanting to look at is which bridges need to stay there, which one need to be taken out, because safety is the most important thing. We don't want someone falling or someone getting hurt. So, you know, they're not, um, you know, they're not in the best condition. And when it floods, it just erodes out those uh, the embankments, and it's it's not great, and it's a it's a safety concern. Um, so we we're hoping to use uh, some of the initial master plan to help get the park up to speed and then be able to use some of the other funding to help with those improvements. But again, trying to make sure that safety comes first and that we're providing um, you know, quality of life and make sure that people don't get hurt at our parks. Uh, Crystal Prairie Lake Park, um, I know that there were some, um, wanted to provide an update on that because that's a, a very a, a long-term uh, park that's gonna take uh, time for it to get developed. Um, so uh, Prairie, excuse me, Crystal Prairie Lake Park uh, is on the northwest side of town. If you haven't been there uh, or seen an aerial, uh, it changes all the time because out there they're, they're dredging sand there to help uh, create um, a lake, essentially. Um, and it's right next to the Brooks Landfill and Cornejo is doing the dredging out there and their contract is going to end here soon. Um, there are some requirements that we have with KDHE to help treat the water for, from the landfill before it gets into, uh, into the lake. There aren't really much improvements or amenities out there right now because Cornejo was out there dredging, helping shape this lake for us. Um, so one of the goals is to, we have a master plan for it that's been on file and keep pushing towards that goal, but again, dredging takes some time. Uh, so we're still pushing for our vision within that master plan, uh, but we do need to make some improvements. Uh, mostly, uh, if you, I guess, we're, if you were to look on a map, Brooks Landfill is, is right here. The uh, park is right over here. Really, along the border around the landfill is where we need to do the treatment. Uh, mostly on the, I guess, southeast corner of the park is where we need to do the improvements to help make sure that we're uh, keeping up with KDHE and all the environmental concerns. So that's, that's our goal. Uh, if there is enough money that we can stretch, we'd like to do maybe some pathways and things like that to help get people aware of the park um, because it, it, it's gonna be a beautiful park here in the future. Um, next is Proc Wetlands Park, and that's one that we are expecting to have funding for next year in the 2023. And so just a little bit of a background on exactly what we're hoping to do with that money or plan to do with that is so phase one here and phase two, they're done at the same time. Um, and again, this is at Mays Road and uh, excuse me, 29th Street West. Um, so phase one is complete, phase two is complete. They were done at the same time. Ideally with this next phase, we would continue this boardwalk Hat and go out to the future duck blind and whatever money that we can squeeze out of it, we'll try to carry this pathway uh, or boardwalk along as far as we can. Um, that's the goal, it's to try to complete this loop. Uh, it's a very unique park. Uh, it's, it's something that I had no idea about uh, when I first joined the city and it's something that uh, is a great amenity and once it is complete, I think um, 
more people will, will begin to know about it and, and use the park. Uh, what's beautiful about this uh, park is that it doesn't use up the whole space. Um, it leaves some of it for uh, the, the, the native plants, the native wildlife and things to actually exist out there without kind of going out there and putting our footprint all over this existing landscape. Uh, so it's, it's a very exciting part and have funding to do that next year. Um, there are some other items of note, um, and I'll welcome uh, any other staff here that wants to chime in, but there are dog parks, have been a conversation, there's, I guess you could, would call it a dog desert, I'm not sure, there's, there's probably a better name for it, uh, but out west there's no, there's no dog park um, that is serving a lot of those uh, residents out there. So there are thoughts and there is um, some conversation about looking at country acres for uh, the potential for a dog park there. Um, there are some issues with that park uh, just because it has some existing infrastructure that will need to be dealt with. Uh, there's a tennis court and I believe a basketball court, both not in great condition, not really used. And there's been a, a lot of conversation about wanting dog parks on the west side of town. Um, so that's one thing that um, is kind of that we're working on is in the in discussions and could be a future CIP item. Can I ask a question about the dog park? Sure. Why west versus like downtown? Most West Wichita is like residential. People have backyards. In downtown, you have I don't know how many thousands of people that live in apartments now. And I don't think we have a downtown dog park, do we? No, and that's actually a, a, another place we were just talking about it today over here at uh, Mayor's Park. It's right next to the uh, post office. At, that is a location for a downtown dog park. We could evacuate the uh, street that, I can't recall the name of that street, um, but uh, to give it more green space. Uh, so that, that is one downtown location that we talked about, and that could serve a lot of the apartments downtown. Uh, west side, the west side has really been asking for a dog park for a long time. And uh, one of the things that we found out, Councilmember Fry helped us out with this. He found uh, the majority of dog licenses are out on the west side. Um, and obviously Harrison on the very far east side most, most recently got a dog park. So those residents out there are really interested in having a dog park. The dog parks are more than just an opportunity for the dogs to uh, spend some time in the uh, plane, but it's also a social aspect for exactly. people as well. Mm -hmm. So obviously downtown, where there's not any yards, that is an interest and that is a priority for those folks. But it's, the same thing happens out on the west side as well. So those folks want a dog park as well. Um, there's a lot of need, not a whole lot of resources. Sure. Thank you. Um, and then, I believe, uh, I believe this is the last point I have here uh, for my presentation, but uh, there's potential for the Buffalo Park, um, one of their, they have tennis courts at Buffalo Park and converting one of those, one of the two existing courts there to pickleball. Um, there's a, on the west side, there's a dog park desert, but there's also a pickle desert out there. Um, so one goal is, or one thought is, is that Buffalo Park would be a great location for that because there are, it's not very close to homes uh, compared to some of the other parks that are out there. Um, it won't cost as much to convert an existing tennis court to a single pickleball court. Um, there are, I believe there may be, I think there are lights out there. I'm not sure, David, you can correct me if I'm, yep. Um, so that would help serve the west side of, side of town, um, uh, kind of give them um, a, one place to play without having to travel uh, to the east, but uh, would be beneficial uh, to convert rather than build a whole new, um, new court system out there, out west. And again, this is at Buffalo Park. I don't know if, if anyone has any other Comments. I guess, um, David, do you have anything else you want to add? Well, we took it to the DAP. We took it down to DAP 5, and we also took it to DAP 4, and just trying to get community feedback. You know, uh, uh, Council Member Bubaugh definitely wants to get a report out west. Uh, he was volunteering in Pontypridd Park at the time. We just don't see the fit with pickleball in Pontypridd.
Library Park. So we started talking about other parks and, and it led us to Buffalo. Uh, Sunset Park uh, is very close to the neighborhood. Um, uh, Railcrush Park is surrounded by neighborhood. That is a possibility, but uh, the fact that there's two tennis courts already there at Buffalo Park, um, converting one court to two courts, two pickleball courts, uh, is going to run that number of about twenty-eight thousand dollars. So that, that's what led us to the conversation of putting pickleball out west. It was two council members asking. Thank you for the thank you for the background. I it's been so long since this conversation kind of started, so I kind of forgot that <laughs> exactly where we began on this. But yes, yeah, we've uh, talked to a number of different uh, council members and, and um, the public about this. Um, I'm not sure if there's um, a, a goal or a support that we'd want from you all uh, on this. I'm not sure. I'll leave that up to Troy. Is that something that we'd like to do? So we want to always keep you appraised of some of the uh, projects that are going on, what are some of the potential projects, uh, what are some of the discussions that are coming across our desk, um, and uh, obviously, we, so you guys could get some input from your constituents as well, so um, we just always want to make sure you guys know what's going on. Wonderful, and um, thank you, and I guess just to end uh, my presentation, this is a photo of College Hill uh, basketball court, and it, kind of forget that um, here in the middle of the city. Uh, so I'll, I'll stand for any other questions. On, on this particular project, I just want to note that uh, College Hill neighborhood actually donated $15,000 towards this. So um, it's always great when we work with the communities and obviously we get their feedback as to what they're expecting and what they want, but even more so when they give us some money. Um, I, I don't know, this year, We've been pretty lucky. We got that $100,000 for the bridge out at Swanson. Uh, this is a little bit of money. Um, the, the, uh, the Park Foundation gave $60,000 towards Swanson for the bridge out at Swanson. Uh, the Community Foundation gave $100,000 for Chester I. Lewis. Um, you know, every time I turn around, there's a, a little bit here and there. Um, I would love to get millions, but I'll take thousands any day. You gotta manifest it, Troy. Yeah. <laughs> manifest those millions. Thank you, Brandon. Is this Katie? Yes, it is. Okay. Welcome. Well, come up, Katie. So while Katie's getting that going, uh, we met a couple of months ago to talk about um, inflatables and did some research, met with the inflatable companies, and uh, I think we got a policy really close to where we want it to be, so Katie's gonna present what we have, uh, working very closely with David and his team. Um, it's been really interesting, and it, it's just another testament of how popular our parks are. and. People just love to have uh, parties and gatherings at our parks. Sorry, give me just a second. So I'll do some more <laughs> talking. Like but, stretch, right stretch. <laughs> but as you saw, the uh, red, white, and boom fireworks show on July 4th. We always have our fireworks on July 4th. Uh, I'm going to have a nice little spot uh, dedicated just for park staff. And if you guys are interested, I'll have some chairs out for you guys as well. So if you guys let us know if you want to come, we'll have some spaces out there for you guys as well. Um, this year, uh, the fireworks, I think, is going to be a little bit bigger than, than last year. Uh, we've spent a little bit more money on the fireworks. And I think this is going to be the last show that we have at this location because there's going to be a building built um, right adjacent to the baseball stadium that's going to keep us from using the space any longer. But I have some other ideas, but I'll share that at another time. 
All right, so I've got an update for you on the inflatables policy. Um, I hope you got Penny's email with the documents. I've also placed it in front of you today. Um, so we've got a final draft of those for you. Um, just a general review of the goals we have for this policy. First and foremost, we want to make sure that uh, our park users who are using inflatables are safe. Um, so we're pre-approving a list of vendors who meet the certification criteria we've set forth. We're going to limit the park locations that we, we have determined to be suitable for inflatables. And so that way vendors can become more familiar with those locations. And then we're, we established the list of guidelines for users and vendors to follow that promote safe use and limit the park department's liability. It's also an easy process for customers. Rather than having to choose from 140 parks, it narrows down the list of locations for them and it still provides some variety. Uh, it's less time for them to spend researching vendors because we have already pre-approved some. Uh, it's an easy process, it's affordable, um, but it does provide the park department some fiscal gain in terms of a certification fee from the vendors, as well as a rental fee and permit fee from the users. So the key changes from the policies that we, I presented last month, um, just a couple changes. Um, due to the low wind threshold that's required to allow inflatables to safely use weighted anchors, we have decided to allow stakes to be used. Um, we have assessed the designated locations. Maintenance has approved those um, in terms of mitigating the potential damage there might be to utilities. So we've actually made some site plans that lay out specific areas within those parks they're allowed to use um, that should be free of utilities. However, it is still on the vendor to call the Kansas 811 Dig Safe line, as well as our Public Works Department to make sure that there are, in fact, not utilities at those locations. And then we've also added a reporting requirement um, for the vendor just to send us weekly updates as to their schedule, as well as an annual summary of the events they've done in our locations, which will help us reconcile with the permits that we've issued throughout the year. So the process, we've really narrowed down to just a couple of steps for both the vendors and the users. So the users will first rent either a shelter or open space, one of our designated locations. They'll um, submit a permit application, including their chosen vendor, their chosen location, their contact info, and just a couple of specs regarding how many inflatables they want and what the sizes are. Um, that way we can make sure that it's complying with the site plans that we've issued. They'll just pay a small permit fee, $25, and then $5 after the first inflatable, and then they'll sign a copy of the policy agreeing to the terms. The vendors will first register with the city as a vendor, and then annually they'll submit a certification application to the park department and provide proof of insurance, inspections, maintenance records, pay the annual $250 certification fee, again, sign the inflatables policy, confirming that they agree to our terms, and then throughout the year, if their insurance expires, they'll give us the updated copy of their insurance um, and then provide reports to us. So here are some of the locations that we have selected. There are 13 locations. There's um, eight shelters, a stage, a gazebo, um, and three open spaces we've designated that are spread throughout the city. And then I can show you what we've worked on on the website. This is not published for the public yet. Um, but we've got, we'll put the list of approved vendors here once we have those. We've got the locations. We'll put a link here so that they can reserve online, easily linking to RecTrack. Provides the address, some additional info, how many tables, rest restrooms nearby, how many inflatables we've allowed based on the space we've designated. And then um, the link to Watson Park. They have a separate inflatables policy there the same process that I just shared with you. And then here will be where they can access the application documents. I'll upload the forms once they're ready. And then they can access site plans here, indicating the little red box for the specific area they're allowed to use. And then a contact form um, for patrons that don't want to call us first, they just want to inquire about some info, they can submit this and it'll send the email straight to our special events team. So what we're asking today is for you to approve the inflatables policy for users and the inflatables policy for vendors. Could you go back to the slide on the fees? I just had a question about this. So for the users, 
the permit fee, is that in addition to the $50? Yes, the, the $50 or the $65 will be for the space that they rent. Um, so that would be if they were renting those shelters for other uses, they would pay the rental either way. And then the permit is for the inflatables, okay. knowing that there will be some wear and tear to like the grass might might get eroded over time using inflatables in the same spots. So that's just to cover that. So oh, so the sixty five and the fifty isn't combined. It isn't a hundred and fifty dollars. Oh, no, so the okay. sixty five will be if it's specifically okay. a location with one of those shelters, okay. and the fifty if it's just if it's an open space. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Except for park board members, they pay. Is that what it is? Okay. Oh, that's good. I don't like bouncy houses. Okay. You guys have other questions? Oh, well, I just wanted to say I'm very pleased with the outcome of this after months of work on it. Uh, and I, I just would hope that for anybody following along and, and uh, uh, keeping track of the activities of the park department, this is an, another example of staff uh, hearing a resident need and meeting that need and exceeding my expectations, frankly, I'm very pleased with, with how this has turned out. And I hope that the learnings that you've gotten from it uh, can help in the future for other kind of projects like this. I'm just very impressed with and the tenacity that you guys have taken toward making this. Um, and I will be very happy if we are moving forward on this to go back to the original resident and say, hey, we found a solution to your, sorry the birthday party's over, but hey, next year, we've got 13 locations to choose from. I'm very, very proud uh, of the work you guys have done here today, so thank you very much. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Well, and, okay, Penny, how does this motion need to read? Is it? All right, so I would move that we approve the inflatable policy for users and the inflatable policy for vendors as prepared by city staff. Second. Any questions or comments? All right, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Wonderful. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. And um, out of respect for everybody's time, I'm going to, Reggie, I don't mean to skip you, but I'm going to jump to Troy and the golf update, if that's okay. <laughs> So a couple of things in regards to golf. Um, what I'm really, really excited about is that we hired a um, golf director, and he starts two weeks from today. Uh, his name is Jesse Kaufman. He's coming from Virginia, and so we all got to be really nice to him so he doesn't leave us. Um, he's got a lot of challenges, and he and I have talked a little bit about that already, um, but we're pretty excited to get him going, and we also I think uh, I shared this last time because I do believe he, um, Darius, did he start last time we met? So um, our admin for this area, his name is uh, Darius Terrell. Terrell. Really sharp kid. Um, I shouldn't call him a kid. A very sharp young man that is uh, learning very, very quickly. So uh, we have one more position to fill in that management area, and that's the food and beverage manager. And we're gonna have interviews on the second day that Jesse's here. He, um, he just found out that he's gonna be part of these interviews, so we scheduled the interviews for him already, uh, so we can get that person hired as quickly as possible. In the meantime, we've also uh, hired a couple other positions in the greenskeeper area, um, and we have made offers to uh, golf superintendent and a golf assistant superintendent. So we're hoping that those offers will come to fruition rather soon. Uh, it's been really, really difficult, not just in golf, but everywhere hiring staff. And um, even our part-time seasonal staff, where an example is in golf, that we have folks that are working in, in a clubhouse and they're making 12 bucks an hour, 11 bucks an hour, but um, they're getting offers at $15 an hour somewhere else. So we're losing people uh, in that regards. So just when I thought we were getting closer to staying in the black uh, in golf, um, you know, it all has to balance. The revenues have to balance out with all the expenditures. So, uh, which brings me to one of the things I wanna talk about is I met with the Golf Advisory Committee and the Golf Advisory Committee I shared with them 
two proposals. One of them is to increase the cart fees uh, by $1.50. And those cart fees would actually be um, dedicated for replacement of golf carts. And so what I want to do is um, they, I get, gather their support and they want me to bring this to the park board. And if the park board supports it, I'm going to be taking it to council in the next uh, two or three weeks. So um, that is the request I'm, I'm bestowing to the park board is to see if you guys will support a $1.50 increase fee for golf carts and that those fees will be dedicated towards replacement of the fleet. Troy, would you remind me what's the fee currently? I, the, the fee for golf carts currently. I could look at it. I have the app. Yeah. Right? 25. So part of the other research that we did was and shared with the park board yeah. was that we You're compared right. it to 25. other cities, other uh, golf courses, and ours is definitely uh, less expensive. And so we're um, not going to be pricing ourselves out of the market. Did we recently, remind me, increase the fees as well for the annual membership? No, which is going to be next. Okay. All right, I just want to make sure we weren't <laughs> increasing all the fees at the same time or anything like that. No, I'm, I'm going to be asking that we increase the passes by 15%. Okay. And the Golf Advisory Committee is also in favor of that? They are, yes. And we went through the scenarios of what that will impact and... Uh, still, a 15% increase in passes is uh, very negligible and very still very, very affordable for them. And they all realize that if we don't increase these passes, um, we're losing money, mm -hmm. uh, losing opportunities to make money as well. And with the increase of expenditures, uh, prim primarily in labor, which we're going to see, uh, we're going to have to start paying more. Uh, obviously, we have to make the balance in making the revenues as well. Question? Yeah, I don't mind it. I mean, twenty six fifty seems reasonable. Okay. I'd support that. Uh, do you need a motion, or what do you need? I do. Yeah. Okay. I would. Uh, I'd motion that we support the dollar fifty uh, car fee increase. Second. Any questions? Concerns? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So the second part of that is a 15% increase on the passes. Um, I'm sorry, I should, uh, uh, it's actually memberships is what we call them. So um, that would be for all the memberships that we offer. And um, we're expecting that to come up with an e increase of revenue of roughly about 150 to $200,000. And those dollars will be used for paying for staff. And. Uh what do you know what the new amounts would be? Off the top of my head, I do not, but it's still relatively cheap. And that's just across the board, 15%? Yeah. Okay. We made the, uh, we gave the Golf Advisory Committee options of 5, 10, or 15%, and they chose the 15%. And then that's a monthly fee that gets charged to everybody. Sorry, I'm just looking up the fee rates on our app. Well, she said this phenomenon is not just unique to us. It's, it's, I spend a good portion of my time in Nashville now for work. I mean, their, their, their uh, golf system has lost money for the last two years in a row. Um, they're paying more in salaries than they're taking in the money. So it was in their paper when I was there uh, two weeks ago. So they're in the, they're in the same situation and they're twice the size we are, so. Um. Well, so far we haven't been losing money. We're right. still in the black, and which you'll see in the, uh, the rounds report here in a minute. But um, the thing about it is we, we know things are changing rapidly. Right. And for us to be competitive, to bring in staff, we have to be able to pay them more. To do that, we have to bring in a little bit more revenue. So, so the largest increase will be to the adult. It'll be like $15 or so. That's the 34 to 61 here. Mm -hmm. 
15 additional dollars. Mm -hmm. And you said all of that would go to staffing? Would pay for staff, yes. Yeah, I'm, I'd be happy to, motion, to make a motion that we uh, adopt a 15% or that we support a 15% increase in fees and membership fees. I'll second. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, any comments or questions? Uh, when would this take effect? So I got to take it to council. Um, I'm going to try to take it to council in the next two or three weeks. I would like to do it sometime in July. Have we heard from the golfers? And they're okay with this as So well? the Golf Advisory Committee, we talked about this in length over several months. Um, and I think they did get some feedback. Um, and it was really interesting when we were doing interviews with each one of the golf candidates for the position. They all uh, mentioned that this was really kind of low. And, and so the committee that was actually doing the interviews agreed with that as well. Um, I think it's a well-known need that we need to address. And, and if we don't do this now, yeah. we'll only we'll be doing it later on. And uh, in the meantime, we're losing opportunities for revenue. Certainly. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Comments? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right. So in addition to uh, those items, I wanted to go over the, the rounds report. And uh, because May was such a rainy month, we actually did not do as well as we did last year in regards to a lot of these categories. Um, and so um, monthly rounds comparisons in May uh, is the second box down there. And we actually, by a little bit, um, uh, total we're 2% lower than what we were in the past, uh, but it's still extremely, extremely good. Um, cart rentals, we're doing really well on. Um, there's an increase from over last year in dollars. Food and beverage is huge amount, 53% increase, uh, which is always a nice boost in the arm. So we know that we're selling more hot dogs. Um, <laughs> merchandise, another area of high increase. Um, we know that we are making a lot more increases over at, um, uh, over at SIM uh, because now that we have a pro there, he's actually able to actually do all the merchandising. Um, the monthly membership comparisons, uh, again, we're having to see an increase there. Uh, we went from 1565 to 1604. We always see that as we go into each summer, but uh, Every year, we're seeing these memberships increasing, which is, which is great. Um, driving range comparisons, um, we actually are losing a little bit of money that we did in the past, but again, a lot of that is simply because of the weather. So um, we had a lot of rain days, a lot of wind days, and even though our Kansas golfers really play in all weather after a while, getting up, beaten up by the, the wind and the rain, uh, we saw a little bit of a drop off, but I, I, I think we're going to be doing just well through the rest of the summer. And I saw we got we, we got our mowers in finally. Yeah, that's awesome. I think all in all, with the rain, it's not a bad month at all. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Troy. Um, Dave, I don't want to skip. I don't. I hate to skip you, but I don't want to keep us too late, we're already five over. So if it's all right with you, I'm gonna kick it over to Troy for the president. Could I just ask David one question? Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, could you brief me on what's gonna be, happen with the bridges that collapse? I mean, the ones actually collapsed into the, the, the floodway. We already have an issue on that corner of the park uh, flooding over into Mount Vernon, so. All right, so we've gone out and floodway fence four, four or five of the, four or five four, of yeah. the uh, bridges. And so we're trying to, like, Tim said, trying to figure out which ones need to stay, which ones can go, and then figure out how to fix, you know, to get by just for the disc golfers. The disc golfers have two of those bridges that they, they really need. So one is the one that has the uh, wooden boardwalk leading wow. to it. So it got tore up in the flood, so we have to figure out how to deal with that. So 
We're just trying to, and one of the bridges is scheduled to come out just shortly. We've okay. already got a bid on that. And so we use that as a go by. Uh, we've got some ideas of, of how to do that. Um, do we have a perfect plan in place yet? No. Nope. Okay. Uh, I mean, I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, <laughs> so I met with Councilmember Holheisel today. Okay. okay. And David's right. We have one bridge that uh, um, is scheduled to come out, and that was at the very end of last year. We uh, found some funding to go ahead and do that because we deemed uh, we were informed that one of the bridges was unsafe, and so we had to take that out. So what we're going to do with uh, 2003? Uh, so I'm sorry, 2023. In 2024, I think we have $2.5 million each one of those years for CLAP, okay? Nice. So, talking to Councilmember Hoheisel, the first priority is to <clears throat> make the infrastructure repairs, and that would be the bridges and any of the cart paths that we have, so we can continue having um, opportunities for people to ride their bikes, run, and, and, and use the trails. Uh, the second portion of that would be in 2024, and that would be another $2.5 million. And two really high profile items that, that he's interested in, and so are we, would be a dog park, which is probably pretty easy to put in. Um, and then next one would be a adventure playground, something that it would be all ages, all abilities. And so those are the priorities that we have going forward. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the funding initiated right now. But that's something that uh, this team back here, as you see, uh, will be working on so we can initiate those fundings and start working on the plans to do that. Um, these are all items that were part of the master plan. And with the way prices are going on right now, and we didn't have enough uh, funding to execute the entire estimate of the master plan, uh, I think we're going to go back out and at least these items I think we can all agree on are high profile items that the community wants and that can be easily put in with, with the money that we have. Because um, what was uh, $5 million worth of construction um, six months ago is, is a lot less now. So those are the priorities that we're looking at right now and that's how we're kind of going to be approaching that. Do you have some of the price tags on some of these assets, like the all abilities, play area, and that type of stuff? No, and it's changing so quickly that right. if we put something together right now, we know a year and a half from now it's going to be a different price. Sure. Um, so the first thing is to address the bridges, address the infrastructure. Um, I think the master plan, although was pretty grand and very interesting and we really liked it, it's still conceptual and um, we'll be pulling out the best items from that and to address it. But I think we're gonna continue keeping with the current parking lot. We're gonna continue keeping with um, really uh, the basic foundation of what the park looks like right now. I don't think it's gonna change much. Um, even with an uh, adventure playground and even with a dog park, I don't think the footprint's gonna change that much. So does that help answer your question? Yes, thank you. Did it answer more of your question? Well, yes, a lot more. <laughs> the biggest thing was, was, was the bridges. And because, you know, as I emailed both of you, you know, I watched someone climb over the bridge and then fall yeah. into the water. Yeah. So they're, they're bypassing your, your, you know, your, your barrier you're putting up. So uh, before someone else falls in. Yeah, um, yeah so. there, there's only so much that we can do in regards to putting barriers, and we want those folks to be safe. Um, but when they don't adhere to them, there's not a whole lot we can do. And um, we, we want them to be safe, and so we want to continue to, to put barriers up there, and, and if we need to put additional signage. Um, but we want to get those items repaired, and that's not going to happen until the funding gets initiated. Right. At least I want to be able to email my four neighborhood presidents and say, here's, what you, here's what's going on, you know, uh, and then also put it on next door for a lot of people. That's, that's what they, they get communication, so. Yeah. Thank you, Troy. Yep. So, there is a way to just pick them up, set them to the side, fix the abutments, you know, so that we can put that same bridge back down. And then we're trying to kick around this idea of how to weld uh, a, a, a 
railing system onto it so that it's safe for, for pedestrians because it was a golf cart path and now it's a pedestrian path so now you need rails on it because it's more than 32 inches off the ground so that's one idea we can kick around how can we use the existing bridge take it off fix it put it back on and make it look good you know we want it to look good because it's not the bridges that are failing, it's the abutments that are being uh, eroded from all the wire going behind it. What we just know, every time it rains and we have a, a very large rain, we get a lot of rain at one time, most of the portion of clap floods, um, particularly at Bluff and Mount Vernon. Uh, that's why I asked about the, la the first bridge that collapsed because it's now in the floodway. And so during this last rain we had, 12 cars that were flooded out in the middle of Mount Vernon that were still there the next morning. So um, everyone knows don't go down Mount Vernon when it's raining because you, you'll get flooded out there at Bluff. So. Well, I'll try. I'll kick it back to you for your update. So we have a lot of new faces and it's been really great um, getting these new folks coming on board. Um, our department looks a little bit different than it did even a year, year and a half ago. But uh, I, I'm extremely happy with our new staff. And as we are gaining our staff back, <clears throat> we're actually able to start catching up on a few things. So um, it's, it was really eye-opening when we start seeing people coming in and, and we go, wow, um, how did we get by with just such a uh, low amount of staffing? But it's all coming back, which is helpful and only helps us improve our service. So that's, I'm really grateful for our new employees and they all seem to be uh, learning very quickly and uh, Kay's a perfect example. We kind of just threw her in and look, she's doing all these great policies and uh, not just meeting Chris's expectations, but going beyond his expectations. That, that's great. Very high, so, so for president, beyond. Yeah, so um, I, I am just, thankful and grateful of our staff and we are working hard and there's a lot of changes but we're moving forward so thank you thank you troy thank you everybody for your time see you in a month